Thank you, Dario, and uh, buongiorno a tutti. Uh, it is an honor for me uh, to be here in Perugia next to beautiful Caravaggio paintings. And uh, especially for you, I've tried to put all the colors of the Margarita pizza on this opening slide. And I want to give you uh, the flavor of what we are currently doing with uh, some invasive species, because we have a lot in Belgium. And as an uh, introduction, um, this is the place the red place in the middle of the map from the Environmental Agency uh, of Europe. Um, this is where I come from, and it is one of the most ugliest areas uh, in the world. They have even made a questionnaire with Belgian people asking uh, what they thought about their own country, and we all responded that we thought it was the ugliest place in the world, simply. We are the champions not only in light pollution, but also uh, in urban sprawl, and we have We've had disastrous urban planning. Um, one generation uh, before me, the generation of my parents, uh, who in the 70s uh, have really ruined our lands with uh, buildings. And as a consequence, uh, we have uh, an extreme degree of fragmentation. 26% of build-up land, that's really gigantic. And uh, why is this a problem? Well, one associated problem is invasive alien species. And if you look at this graph, uh, it shows you the level of plant invasions uh, based on floras uh, throughout Europe and you can see that uh, we are uh, second uh, to the UK, so it's really uh, a gigantic problem. And uh, this occurs actually throughout uh, all environments, both the marine, the terrestrial and certainly everything underwater. Uh, it's really a dramatic increase both in rate and number of aliens. And um, this is how genuinely, uh, a few days ago, uh, our Flemish coast uh, was advertised in an in-flight magazine uh, when flying to Perugia. Um, I can see uh, some of the attraction that comes with it, but um, when I go to my coast, I mostly want to see this type of uh, pristine uh, ecosystem where ecosystem processes like shifting sands can still uh, occur. And um, I just wanted to show you uh, this work we've been doing in our dunes. We have a 73 kilometer coastline uh, with a very high degree of fragmentation. And you can see on the map, for instance, uh, the green, the green uh, areas there are actually natural zones. Most of them are nature reserves. And um, on the right hand side, you see uh, an inventory of alien plant species that has been made in one of those areas. And you can really see that the natural areas are extremely small and they are effectively just islands in a sea of proper cool pressure of invasives. Um, and they include a number of uh, invasive shrubs like uh, Japanese roads and Oregon grape. Uh, and these are creeping uh, bushes that really fix the sand. So they are a big problem for ecosystem integrity. This cottoniaster species you would normally find in, uh, in gardens uh, and at some places it looks like uh, the desert of New Mexico with yuccas and uh, all kinds of alien poplar species. So this is what um, conservation managers are faced with uh, all the time in their nature reserves in Flanders. And uh, of course this comes at a huge management cost. We have some data on uh, how these aliens come in um, and we've tried to map here the number of alien species coming in in Belgium on the, the CVD pathways that Pierre explained about. As you can see we have a lot more data on plants uh, but let's focus on the animals uh, for now and you can see that in fact um, many of them uh, come into our nature deliberately as escapees but a number of them also accidentally as stowaways. And I will just uh, give you some examples. And this is to say that new pathways are opening up all the time. And this is a very recent one uh, that is gaining more and more attention in Belgium. It's entomophagy. People start eating uh, other proteins, notably from insects. And so we are importing uh, and rearing at a large scale crickets and, uh, and mealworms and uh, all kinds of critters and snails. And there is absolutely no risk assessment ecologically being done on that. Um, um, as a consequence of all of that, uh, we are faced uh, with uh, many, many introductions of uh, a wide array of species. And uh, I wanted to show you a few squirrels. This is an American, uh, an American species, Tamiasquirus, American red squirrel, which is more and more uh, 
being observed in the Netherlands. Um, if the animal uh, on the picture is in a cage, it means we have rapid response to it. If it's not in a cage, it means it's still roaming somewhere in our Flemish forests. Uh, this is another one, a fantastic, uh, colorful, prevost uh, squirrel from Southeast Asia. Um, and this, uh, this animal was uh, observed in 2015 in uh, the Zonian forest. It's actually a forest on the border between Flanders and Wallonia. And it was chased after by seven people from the Walloon organization trying to trap or shoot it, but uh, they failed. Um, and by the way, all the animals that I show are not on our positive list. So it means we still do have a problem with uh, internet trade and with uh, animals being illegally kept, perhaps by people that aren't even aware this is a problem. Many countries in Northwest Europe have abolished uh, fur farming. But not Flanders. Our ministry, uh, our minister, in fact, has decided to grant permits until 2030 for 16 mink farms. So all the mink farming from the Netherlands and the UK is moving to Belgium. Um, as a consequence, we find some minks uh, now and then in our nature. Um, and we were able to uh, luckily catch this couple quite quickly. Um, it's quite amazing that the mink has never really. Um, established in Belgium. We have no idea why, perhaps they have a uh, different genetic makeup, but uh, it's perhaps a species to look out for. Um, let's go to herbs. Uh, we don't have your Triturus carnifex, uh, which hybridizes in the Netherlands with uh, the protected Cristatus, but uh, since this year we do have Marmaratus, uh, it's alien to Belgium, and we even have a population of snakes, Taiwanese rat snakes, uh, somewhere in Limburg, that seems to be reproducing. And lately, uh, the most recent acquisition uh, is facing us with a real problem among conservation people because it's an invasive orchid uh, that invaded a very sensitive habitat. Um, and in fact, it should be there in that vegetation type, uh, but not that crossing. So it's, it's actually a hybrid between uh, Spirantis cernua and odorata. The odorata, uh, the real odorata nominate form uh, smells um, very agreeable, to, like a vanilla. But if you cross it with cernua, uh, it smells like cat piss, actually. Uh, and so now we are faced with this problem that some people want the orchids to remain and other people say, no, we should as quickly as possible remove it uh, to prevent future problems. And it's a problem to without any data on, uh, on impact to convince people this should be done. Um, other aliens um, are perhaps bad for plant health, like, like this box tree moth, which is destroying uh, our box trees on cemeteries and in the gardens. But in the same time, they, prevent, they, pr they bring opportunity, because uh, box tree is everywhere in Flemish gardens, and now it has to be replaced by people. But we also have one native box tree stand uh, on a calcareous grassland in the south that will probably disappear in time. So all of this just as an introduction to show you uh, some evidence that the situation is pretty bad in Belgium. In part this has to do with the fact that we have very good data. As you can see on this graph Belgium comes second and is in fact with 28 species in the top uh, in terms of occurrence of union list species in the EU. Uh, but it's mostly because we have very good data on the casuals um, that are there. So conservation implications are costly surveillance, a management cost, and we have to be smart in prioritizing. Because, for instance, controlling a topmouth gudgeon that is everywhere and is virtually uncontrollable makes no sense. Whereas a munchak who has just got one population somewhere in one province is another matter. And for some species, there might be scope to limit their spread. For instance, eastern baccaris, which is a problem in halophyte vegetations, is near our coast, uh, and we want to prevent it coming into the Skeld uh, River, where we have sensitive ecosystems. OK, so I will be talking mostly about the early detection and rapid response and the control and mitigation uh, we are doing in our country. 
And um, this has to be accompanied, first of all, by uh, good surveillance. Um, so that we set up a surveillance system. It's mostly using a recording system uh, used by naturalist community. Um, and uh, there has been an alert system built on that. So as a manager of a nature reserve or anyone working in invasive species control, you can actually uh, set alerts on specific species and specific areas. And uh, by email, um, at midnight, you receive an email with the new observations of uh, worrisome species in your nature reserve. And it works pretty well. Uh, it also comes with fact sheets, such as here, for invasive squirrels, where people can find uh, information on how to ID those species. Um, and here's some proof that actually it works. It's been used for uh, the sacred ibis, for instance. Um, sacred ibis uh, mostly uh, arrives in Belgium as spillover from uh, populations in France um, and the Netherlands. It's almost gone. And probably some escapees from uh, a zoo that we have in the south. Uh, but when uh, this sacred ibis started to annoy our only or sole spoonbill colony, uh, in the Antwerp Harbour area, we decided to rapid response it. Ruddy duck, almost gone from Belgium. Um, I think uh, since the live project in the UK, uh, it's mostly France and the Netherlands that have a responsibility now. We m more or less have less than five birds uh, every winter and we are tackling every bird. And on the right hand side, you can see um, a thing that Ilaria has also explained about. It's not a ruddy duck, it's an Argentinian ruddy duck. So you can see that the sector uh, is really switching to other species. And as an anecdote, um, on the top there, the two ducks, uh, only the right one is a, is a male ruddy, and uh, below is actually a white-headed duck. Uh, white-headed is a very uh, big rarity in Belgium, so when it popped up, it, it attracted uh, a crowd of birders and twitches twitchers who wanted to add it to their list, uh, but we also used it as a decoy because it attracted male ruddy ducks. So we were able to shoot uh, three or four ruddy ducks um, because this whitehead was there. Asian Hornet is uh, also a recent acquisition, so we do have it in Belgium since 2015, and uh, some naturalists sent me photos from the year before of a nest, so we are probably already too late to really tackle uh, this invasion. Uh, huge discussions going on on who should be managing it, uh, the fire squad, the civil uh, protection service or even private companies or beekeepers themselves. Chinese Muntjak, um, they are there in the center of Antwerp province. They probably escaped from a few uh, very big estates where they were kept in collections uh, to be introduced for hunting purposes. They are now roaming free. Uh, in Flanders, and I think we are somewhere halfway the lag time if we look at the situation in the UK. They live on uh, corn and, uh, and common ivy mostly, and that's what's in their bellies, as you can see. Uh, and in the last years, I think this is one of the more worrisome species because you can see the uh, incidence of observations is really uh, increasing. Egyptian goose, um, we are trying to tackle Egyptian, but it's everywhere. And the only thing we can do is place multi-capture traps like this because you can't get to their nests to do fertility control. And for some species, we are simply doing nothing or too late, such as this harlequin ladybird, which is wiped out, uh, or two-spot ladybirds um, in Belgium. <coughs> and in fact, also a Japanese knotweed. Uh, we are only tackling that one when it represents a safety, uh, health and safety hazard for shipping or uh, when it uh, impairs on the visibility of traffic. And a typical problem that we face is that when you do manage it, for instance by grazing or mowing, you simply get another invasive in return. Uh, so we're seeing compensating increases in uh, invasive species that live in the same habitat. It can be Himalayan balsam, but it can also be uh, this one, giant hogweed. So the only option we are then left with is to uh, produce some alcohol from it. Uh, now this is a gin which was produced by the city's ecologists from the city where I live in Ghent. It's a very expensive gin, but it's made uh, of giant hogweed and, and a Japanese knotweed, notably. 
The problem is you only need a handful of leaves to produce enough flavor uh, for 100 liters of alcohol. So it will never work in terms of uh, population control. But it is an option we consider. As for instance, also with the geese, uh, look at Canada geese. We are managing Canada geese in Belgium uh, by mold trapping. So in June, when they change their feathers, they are flightless and you can easily trap them in cages. Uh, we've been doing that for 10 years now and we're really seeing a very uh, dramatic reduction in their numbers. Um, so it's a means of population control and uh, at the bottom there you can see the mayor of Ghent who is uh, trying uh, goose legs, um, tasting goose legs. Okay, but I really wanted to talk about squirrels because this is a squirrel symposium. So I was hoping to give you a case study um, of a successful rapid response uh, of a population of palace squirrel. There's been some talk about palace squirrel because you have it in Bezzo di Bredero. Um, and um, the story really begins, a beautiful species with a red belly. The story begins in 2005. Um, it is a species that uh, is native to Asia and um, there are some very well documented invasion histories uh, elsewhere in the world such as in Argentina and Japan. Um, it's clear that it can reach very high densities and um, it's a problematic one especially because it also uh, does bark stripping and it uh, knows cables, um, it can lead to uh, power cuts etc. And this is actually what it does when you start monitoring uh, palace squirrels using hair traps, um, this is what it does to the trap. It's really a, a rather dramatic. Um, they're very opportunistic and they thrive well in human, uh, human mediated landscapes. Um, and so in 2005, uh, suddenly we were confronted with sightings of uh, this species. Um, in a suburban park uh, and it's taken a while before people even acknowledged this could be an invasive species or a problem because initially uh, it was misidentified as a Chinese rock squirrel and we had to uh, go to the geneticists uh, with samples and ask them to run species IDs at first um, but so it slowed down the response that we were unaware this was in fact a palace squirrel. Uh, you can see where that happened in the west of Flanders, in the province of Western Flanders, somewhere a small village, 4,000 inhabitants, with two uh, suburban parks. Luckily, this was kind of like a, an island situation. It was surrounded by potato and cornfields, uh, which is not a perfect habitat to squirrels. So this was probably has bought us some time. Um, and uh, at that place, um, it appeared to be an amusement park. Um, as you can see from some of these installations there, that had to close down in 2000 because uh, a little boy lost his arm on one of the attractions and it was not okay anymore, so it had to close down. But apparently there were also some cages uh, with animals uh, being kept there and so some of them probably escaped. As you can see from some of this sign, this sign said, attention, the deer can break out, please uh, close the door. Um, just some pictures of the situation here and um, at nice days when there were no leaves on the trees you can see the palace girls uh, happily roaming uh, the trees they were making nests in monumental trees and so there was some concern also of the park manager that there might be damage uh, by the squirrels to these monumental trees which has really convinced um, several people and several agencies that action was uh, needed the park was also heavily used by uh, people for recreation, so it involved some communication lines uh, with the municipality. And of course you are faced with um, the problematic detection of the squirrels, especially when the trees uh, are in bloom. Okay, so the eradication started in 2005 with rather opportunistic captures by the site manager but it took two years before we realized we were faced with a real problem and then uh, responsibilities had to be put on paper, someone had to go look for a budget 
and we also wanted a signature of the High Council for Nature Conservation and the Minister, so that no one could object to our uh, actions. The methodology was fairly simple. Luckily, these pieces can be equaled with very low-tech uh, gear, so we produced some traps ourselves. Uh, the traps were baited, pre-baited, because this is essential to efficiently capture um, uh, invasive squirrels. We do that before the breeding season, just like you do it in Italy. And uh, the animals were uh, humanely killed using carbon dioxide. So with the pre-baiting stations, we uh, put a wildlife camera, and every time a squirrel was detected, the, the trap was installed. That was more or less the system. And when uh, we removed the animal, then we removed the whole predating station and the process started over again. So just to show you how it's done. This is the mobile field unit we used for the euthanasia. It also contains uh, a completely um, yeah, a, a nisofluorine evaporator, sort of professional installation and uh, all these handlings were performed by a veterinarian. And um, yes, it took us five years, but in the end we managed to capture 250 squirrels. You would probably find this is rather ridiculous that it took us five years to capture uh, 250 squirrels, but you have to realize that this is run on existing capacity and it's not a dedicated life project uh, as you are running uh, for some species. If you look at the numbers in reality, because that was the cumulative number of uh, captured animals, but if you look at it in reality, you can see that in fact you have to bring your population through a number of bottlenecks. Uh, in this case, you can see uh, four or five peaks. And so every year there has been some reproduction. You think the animals are gone, but then the next year there is the disappointment with the trappers. Oh, they are still there and they have reproduced and the process starts all over again and you need like five years uh, to get rid of them. And then of course afterwards you have to spend some time uh, to be really sure you got to the last one. In terms of the money, uh, most of the money is going to the captures and some coordination. And actually uh, the gear and all the materials you need are not so expensive. Um, it's mostly trapping and preparation and coordination and communication that uh, are taking uh, most of the budget. In total it has cost, uh, theoretically cost about 200,000 euros uh, in five years to get rid of 250 squirrels. So it means that even rapid response uh, requires uh, some considerable means, I think. So I, I mostly think it's been successful because we were pretty quick and from interviews with local people we know they probably were there for a year and a half already um, and we can calculate back based on the captures using ma maximum likelihood techniques we can calculate back the densities initially and uh, they were at about 3.1 squirrels per hectare which is way below what uh, palace squirrel in invasive populations elsewhere in the world can, can attain. So a quick reaction time has certainly been important. And also the uh, insular context that I explained about uh, this graph has been shown by Craig also. Um, it shows a number of um, eradication uh, projects uh, in Europe below. And you can see our palace squirrel uh, eradication was really run over a very small surface area. And actually in the top graph you can see that it it's quite comparable to some uh, island eradications in terms of the area cost relationship. So uh, many things could be improved uh, if we were to be faced with a similar invasion in the future. I think we would have a decent contingency plan. We need a coordinated rapid response. We have the experience now and uh, it would probably be wise to foresee some uh, time and resources uh, if something like that happened again. The situation in Europe with palace squirrel, um, I can show you here, and probably you are interested to know that uh, the elder population in Holland uh, has been eradicated uh, or declared to eradicate a year ago. Um, the results of those actions will be published shortly. 
But I think the main populations are still in the south of France, in Antibes and Bouche du Rhône. The French are eradicating, but uh, it's on the way, they're not finished yet, I think. Uh, and many more species are awaiting us. Um, Tamias Sibiricus is on the Union list. We have two populations in Belgium, but we are planning to tackle them. Uh, it is actually also on our positive list, which is a bit strange, and it has to be changed, uh, and it will be changed, I guess. Do I have more time for another case study? Jenny? Ah, that's fine. Okay, from uh, squirrels to bullfrog, uh, which is another species that you are probably a bit acquainted with and is still expanding its range in Tuscany, notably. Um, it is on the other end of the invasion curve because uh, here we are talking about a well-established invader. Um, it's a fantastic invasive species. It's called a very flexible life history strategy, an enormous, uh, gigantic reproductive output to give you an idea. Common toad, female, lays like 4,000 eggs per clutch, uh, whereas uh, this American bullfrog, uh, a female, lays 40,000 eggs, so 10 times more, and it can reproduce several times a year. So uh, it's really gigantic. Um, it's got an impact through uh, pathogen transmission, mostly chytrid fungus, that you all know of. It is a gate-limited predator, which <coughs> means it will virtually eat anything that passes in front of its nose, including bats and mice and, uh, and waterfowl, even. And it also has some uh, ecosystem-level effects that have been well documented uh, elsewhere in the world. So it's a species we'd rather not have uh, in our nature, uh, where native amphibians are roaming and already struggling to survive it's native to the Rocky Mountains, uh, and actually only uh, to the eastern part of the Rockies. It's considered invasive in the western part of, the, of North America. Populations in Europe are in the Po Valley, in France, in the Gironde, and Dordogne, and Sologne area. And as you can see, we are actually having quite a responsibility in Belgium, because we're one of three of the major nuclei in Europe. Uh, so how are we trying to tackle this? Uh, this is just to show you that Wallonia also has one population. It's the, the black dot there uh, in the south. It's right near uh, Charleroi Airport. So if you take a Ryanair flight, you will fly right over that population. Uh, but in Flanders, this is what we are stuck with. We have a big river valley population where they reproduce. Uh, and then some peripherous ones that are smaller, but where it is also present. Um, the, the type of habitat where it lives is a really degraded, impoverished uh, freshwater habitat with a lot of algae blooms. Uh, the larvae, the tadpoles, live on algae, so uh, they are thriving well in these kind of uh, uh, habitats that are in very bad conservation status, as you can see. The fringing vegetation is uh, completely alien uh, as well. And when you look at it on a map, you can see that it's horribly complicated to start managing that. It's all very fragmented, uh, a complex metapopulation structure of like five or six, uh, six thousand ponds that are also interconnected by a river. Uh, so how, how to start doing that? It seems almost uh, impossible. The plan is we eradicate um, the peripherous populations, of course, and then we try to contain and mitigate its impact in the river valley. But managing bullfrogs is extremely, extremely difficult, uh, and I'll explain you why. You have a very uh, pyramidal uh, demography in this population where the adults exert predation pressure, so they are cannibalistic on the metamorphs. The metamorphs are those that still have a tail and four legs. And then below we have an enormous cohort of, uh, of uh, thousands of tadpoles. So when you remove um, an adult from the population, what you're actually doing, you're releasing a metamorph from the cannibalism. And the metamorph is a stage that disperses into the environment because they can live on land, but they can also swim very well. So you're actually inducing their dispersal. Uh, 
And when you're taking away only the tadpoles, there is a strong density dependence in that cohort, which means the tadpoles that remain uh, have more food and space. And so instead of doing the whole cycle in two years, which they normally do move from, they will speed up their metamorphosis and do it in one year. So you could say that for every bullfrog uh, that you, uh, you are killing, you're getting some in return. Uh, on top of that, uh, in these habitats we have pumpkin seed, topmouth gudgeon. They are non-native fish and they are really specialist macroinvertebrate predators. Macroinvertebrates, for instance, dragonfly larvae or the tiskidae larvae that predate on tadpoles or could predate on tadpoles. And so there is some sort of a facilitation of this non-native fish with uh, the bullfrog themselves and they profit from each other and have a higher survival in the tadpole stage. So you have to do it all at once. Tackle invasive fish, tackle the tadpoles, tackle metamorphs and catch adults. So how to do this? When you have access to the land, when you actually own the land, this can be done. Just drain the pond. You can also see the blue fence that we put around it because if you lower the water level or adapt the hydrology uh, of their habitat, they will immediately react, get out of the water and try to get away. So the first thing you have to do is fence the area and then you can drain. And with sand netting, we can then remove uh, the remaining invasive fish and tadpoles. Um, this is work that is done actually with uh, rehabilitated uh, prisoners. They love to do that and also people from social economy. Um, and then afterwards, if you can, uh, we will just restore this habitat in a, a more original and more interesting and biodiverse state using means. We do some science, uh, there is a lot of science behind this. Uh, we do capture mark recapture uh, using tattooing, classic tattoo uh, devices uh, to get an idea on the densities, as you can see here. And after all this work, in fact, the tadpoles are overdosed with uh, bad street cocaine. It's called benzocaine, it's a substance that first um, um, makes them unconscious and then they get overdosed. So two-step approach, which is considered humane for amphibians. We know that the density in ponds uh, fluctuates a bit, but we can get a pretty good idea of the density uh, using one catch per unit effort, which means you put a double fight net in the pond uh, and you do one effort of catching it, uh, you can get a very good idea of the density which is incredibly important because this type of information is asked by the managers. They want to know how long will it take before we can reduce their densities to an acceptable level. And we also have an idea on the catchability with our capture gear, which is about 6%. So with every catch per unit effort, you take out 6% of the mostly the larval population of uh, bullfrogs in a pond. And this way you can try to deplete uh, their numbers. But then, of course, depletion is one thing, but we will probably never get rid of them. Uh, not even in one pond is very difficult. So we've been looking into a method of um, yeah, aftercare. Um, and what we came up with was uh, introducing uh, native predatory fish, in this case, uh, pike. We've also been trying uh, Welsh catfish, uh, which didn't work very well. But, um, the pike, yeah, we performed some experiments to know whether pike really eats bullfrog and whether it can impact on their densities. This was a fully replicated uh, setup. And uh, here are some results. It's especially the left hand graph that is interesting. You can see uh, the treatments where we introduced pike, pike are uh, <coughs> the lowest bars on the graph. And uh, on the x axis, you have the years. Uh, so this was an experiment that was run over two years only. Uh, and you can see that um, in all the treatments with pike, we see uh, a tenfold uh, decrease of tadpole numbers. So yes, pike do have uh, an impact on uh, tadpole densities by direct predation. And there is also an indirect effect on the quality of the habitat. These are some measures we took of transparency and also the macrophytes the underwater vegetation that is present in those places 
and we see very positive effects uh, of that because the pike is also taking out the bentivoric fish, the carp that are roaming the bottom of the pond and that are actually causing the particles to float uh, pelagically, which is then preventing the sunlight from reaching the bottom, so plants cannot grow. So in fact you have a whole ecosystem level effect by introducing this predator, and if you combine that with active removal of tadpoles, we think we are somewhere in managing uh, American bullfrog. Okay, uh, conclusions. I think in Belgium, uh, looking at it, uh, what we are doing on, on invasive alien species, I think, we have good scientists, uh, and we're very good at studying invasions, we have some ideas of uh, species that we can expect in the future. We have pretty good risk assessment, the risk assessment protocols and systems. And we have a relatively decent uh, surveillance system, although this can be more targeted towards specific species uh, and includes more stakeholders than just the naturalist community. But where we have a serious problem is with invasion literacy. We have to really educate uh, children at school and uh, tell people about this invasion problem. And uh, I can sense uh, invasion denialism, which is kind of an international global problem, uh, also in the, especially in the popular press. Uh, and it's the same in Belgium. Uh, more and more people are writing books and opinions in the newspaper about why invasives are really a problem. And there is some sort of fatigue also that I can sense uh, not only with volunteers, that uh, it's typical. Uh, the Canada goose uh, arrives in the 70s, it starts breeding, everyone wants it on their list, and then when it becomes very abundant, no one bothers uh, noting the species down anymore. So it's a problem for monitoring. But also the managers are kind of uh, sometimes uh, feeling hopeless um, because, yeah, sometimes there are no good methods and it seems like such an endless business managing uh, these invaders. So uh, many things can be done in terms of uh, spreading uh, good practices and spreading successful examples of uh, invasion management. Biosecurity, we have no idea about biosecurity in Belgium. There is virtually no biosecurity. You can bring in whatever you want um, in our country. And you can see my colleague there who is applying biosecurity during uh, goose fieldwork uh, in order not to spread kitter's fungus. I think this kind of practice uh, should be practiced more. But I am facing problems to, uh, to have a corporate strategy on biosecurity even. So even biologists uh, need to be educated sometimes about these things in order not to spread invasives during fieldwork. And they are a category of people that, that come in touch with invasive quite regularly. Um, and to wrap up, in terms of management, I think the big challenge is uh, ground capacity. I am quite impressed seeing the array of life projects uh, here that are running in Italy, um, uh, the number of projects you have, and you seem to almost have a project on every invasive species, uh, Vespa, black rats, uh, it's, it's quite amazing. We've had a few projects uh, in the past, like Invexo and RID, which were interact projects, uh, tackled a number of species at the same time. We've had Alterias, which was a project on invasive plants, trying to work with the horticulture sector and agree on a list of species that wouldn't be sold anymore. Uh, but I think we can do a better job in uh, trying to get live bits in and be successful in that. Bullfrog would be a perfect start, but also uh, invasive water plants um, should be tackled urgently. So we have pathway action plans in the making, which is good. Thank you, EU regulation. Uh, we have some dedicated projects, but they are mostly finished now. We have certainly an interest from businesses and social economic companies to be uh, managing invasives. And we are good, I think, in volunteer involvement. But we need to be more active uh, when it comes to involving private businesses. And uh, we ur urgently also need a government-run rapid response system because sometimes working with specific stakeholders is not that easy when you want to be successful in managing invasives. I thank you.
thank you to the Nigerians for the, the interesting overview of the situation, the problems, and the activities in the region. We have time for uh, two uh, fast questions. Thanks, Tim. It was a really great talk. I, I have a question about the American book project. It's one I'm studying actually right now. Browns are just more known. Browns is a life project that is trying to control the population. And so the main problem that we have telling you right now is that we don't know where the species is. We know the density is quite low, but we don't have a clear idea about which areas are invaded. So according to your experience, what's the best way to locate species? We have like, a database about acoustic surveys, but we don't know if we can rely on that kind of database. Now we're starting to use environmental DNA. There are also problems with that, but it's probably the most reliable technique, but actually we don't have clear knowledge about that. So from your viewpoint, tracking techniques, acoustic surveys, environmental DNA surveys, what's the best way to I think the best way is to combine them all. So you, should, you can, for instance, uh, involve naturalists and have them adopt a kilometer square, and go in door to door, ask people if they can go in their garden, look in their garden plant, and do very classical surveys, listening to the juveniles, making the eep sound, and uh, look for calling males. Uh, but that is really a snapshot that can be misleading. So you need to combine it with things like eDNA, and we are now training people to, to learn how to take a decent water sample that can be used for eDNA. Uh, the problem is we cannot use the technique that has been developed in France because they have another, they have Rana Dalmatina, and we don't have Rana Dalmatina, we have Temporaria, and so our method gives a lot of false positives when we apply it in Belgium, but nearly there, uh, but not yet. Um, so yeah, it's a combination of uh, different things and, and it certainly needs professional involvement if you want to do it right because even the volunteer uh, uh, has to be uh, targeted and coordinated in a way. Another problem that we have for example is very difficult to define the buffers of the distribution. We should focus on a buffer of 10 kilometers, 3 kilometers, 2 kilometers from the most very area. It's something that actually we don't know but it's affecting a lot the area that we have We've actually put some transmitters during the project in uh, male and female bullfrog and they seem to be relatively sedentary. So the male was using uh, a distance of 800 meters uh, at most and he was mostly going to other ponds to look for females. But we have no idea on the metamorphs because they are too small to put a transmitter in them. Uh, and actually also the adults, uh, as I heard from you, they ex expose uh, whatever you put in them. Uh, because they don't like uh, strange things in their bodies. So we have a pretty bad idea. But our advice has been to not create new ponds, because pond creation is something uh, ecological restoration uh, does all the time for amphibians. And uh, around, in a buffer zone of uh, five kilometers around our bullfrog population, we advise people not to create amphibian habitats. So this, I think this could be a way, if you cannot fence specific populations, to reduce uh, the rate of their spread. Excellent. There is more question. Uh, I said that you use the volunteers for early warning and for intervention. Uh, how many volunteers do you do in your experience? It's more or less. Uh, we don't use the volunteers for uh, interventions, so most of the interventions are done through a contract that the Agency for Nature and Forest has with specific organizations. And most of the work, if you have to handle a rifle or a trap, it requires permits and skill. Um, so we don't do that with volunteers. Uh, and in terms of the numbers that are involved, uh, there are vast numbers. Volunteers. I think uh, there are more than 800 people um, working on our early warning system. 
And I must say it's just a portal that has been built on a general recording system, so I don't think, I think many of the people are not even aware that their data are being used for management. But for a small segment of them, the fact that management results from their observations is really an incentive to be working with us. So, yeah. Thank you, team, for your interesting overview. And the last uh, presentation.